Welcome to Fire Safety, a brief overview of fire control primarily using fire extinguishers. In this program, we'll explore a couple of different avenues. We'll look at the different types of fire extinguishers available most commonly to most of us, as well as how to use them, how they're maintained for future, and how to give a brief once over to make sure that they're properly placed and in good repair. So thank you for joining me and hopefully uh, taken away from this course will be something uh, that one day you may never use but if you do you'll be able to fall back on the information learned here and potentially save a life or someone's property. An introduction to fire safety is, is a fairly broad scoped uh, adventure. And what I'm talking about is it's awfully difficult to start on this little journey we're going to go on without looking at the obvious. What's the obvious? The obvious is if you take care of yourself and your space around you and I take care of myself and my space around me and we're as safe as we possibly can be, the chances are our risk level will go down exponentially. However, it doesn't always work out that way. In this fast-paced society, we're coming and going uh, at phenomenal rates. Oftentimes, we're doing this without paying attention to some of the finer details that we used to. So, when it comes to fire safety, uh, the best way to introduce this particular subject is understand your surroundings. If there are things that are flammable or combustible that are within eye shot from you, know they're there. Know what type of flammability rating they've got. Uh, what types of fire extinguishers that they would possibly be using and have a good working knowledge of where your working area is as opposed to where the fire suppression means are, where the fire extinguishers are, uh, potentially where a hose is uh, or water. Understanding that stuff, well, that just minimizes our risk. So we're going to be talking about uh, fire control and how to use a fire extinguisher and, and uh, how to make sure that they're placed properly and things of that nature. But understand that this is only a presentation done online. What should happen after today? Well, what should happen is this should be followed up with some practical applications most likely in your shop. The worst scenario that somebody could be in is being on a job site, having some sort of fire breakout, and the first time they've ever seen or used a fire extinguisher was right there at a job site when somebody's life may be on the line or somebody's property may be on the line. There's a lot of intricacies to using a fire extinguisher that we just don't think about. For instance, when you look at the fire extinguisher here on the screen. The first thing that we think of here is we think, okay, well, I've seen that a red fire extinguisher. We got the, uh, the handle up here. We got the pin in place, uh, which allows us to, to keep that handle from depressing um, by accident. So when we're going to use this, we pull that pin out and uh, we aim the hose here. Uh, at the, the base of the fire, we sweep it side to side and we pull, uh, we pull down on this as we're doing that. And that's, that's basically what makes the, uh, the suppressant agent that's inside of the extinguisher come out. I get that. I've seen that on TV. I've heard people talk about it. But until you do it, that application is really seeming simple. Do it. At a safety meeting, uh, at an internal meeting at the shop, uh, somewhere along the line, make sure that you're, you get your hands on a fire extinguisher and you're able to practice. They do have a lot of pushback, so that may be one of those things that you're just not prepared to deal with. If the first time you pull that pin 
is when property damage is at stake and you have to make sure that you use that fire extinguisher uh, to the most efficient use as possible you, you may be surprised at how much kickback it has and if it freaks you out you might drop it or you might hold the handle down uh, longer than it needs to be held down or in a fashion that's not even on the fire because it startles you right at first you only get roughly a minute ish on most of these fire extinguishers uh, once that is uh, depressed uh, to hold that down for your fire suppression so it's not a lot of time now when it comes to portable fire extinguishers it's one of the most common fire protection appliances used today uh, in most cases, many cases, the portable fire extinguisher uh, can be used to put out a fire in a lot less time than other methods. Now, it's not to say that it is the only method out there. There are fire blankets and things of that nature, but uh, much more common uh, is your run-of-the-mill fire extinguisher. Uh, even though they're common, one of the things that... Uh, gets kind of lost in the shuffle is there are standards that are followed in order to make sure that uh, fire extinguishers are compliant. All of the fire extinguishers have to meet the criteria that you're going to find in NFPA 10, which is the standard for portable fire extinguishers. Uh, and then they've also um, got to have that underwriter's laboratory uh, rating in the United States. When it comes to fire extinguishers, there is more than just a one-size-fits-all attitude for them. Now, it is true, you can get a fire extinguisher that fits several different categories uh, of potential fires, uh, but you could also get individual rated fire extinguishers. They come in different sizes. Uh, they look a little bit different from time to time, and they're designed to fight different types of fires. Uh, for instance, the three we have listed here, A, B, and C, are a great example. A is going to be your ordinary combustibles. B is going to be your flammable liquid. C is going to be your electrical equipment. And in the coming minutes, we're going to talk a little bit more about those. And, uh, you know, one thing that is important to note, we don't just have a letter designation for these, do we? We also have a color, a picture, uh, and those are very key uh, indicators as to what type of fire extinguisher we got. And it's easy to see from a long ways away, even for folks uh, that have hindrances with reading or, or the alphabet. Uh, we can always see the shapes and the colors uh, that go along with that. So let's talk for a moment about the fire triangle. What in the world is a fire triangle? Well, when you look at it, fire is basically a chemical reaction. It really takes three conditions to happen perfectly to produce a fire. you got to have some sort of fuel, enough heat to raise its temperature to the point that it wants to ignite, and enough oxygen pres present to sustain that combustion. Now, with those three ingredients happening just so, well, you're going to get the fire triangle. Okay, and that fire triangle is, is used to refer to uh, the sustainability and um, the probability of any certain chemical uh, becoming flammable or combustible and what it takes to get there. Oftentimes, you're going to see the fire triangle with percentages and this and that. Uh, maybe even I've seen some that have the upper and lower explosive limit, um, you know, the amount of oxygen, uh, how, how much of the fuel to air, uh, air ratio it takes. It can get very complicated. I didn't want to stay in that complicated range. Uh, in my opinion, there's definitely a place for that. There's a science behind this stuff. But if we're here for just an hour, or two hours, or four hours, we're not going to come out of this with a degree. But we do need to come out of this with a better understanding of how fire works, what causes it, how do we get rid of it.
or control it. And in that uh, case, we're looking at it in very simplistic forms. The three basic conditions that we're looking at that need to happen is we've got to have fuel to burn. We've got to have heat that's going to raise that temperature to the point it wants to ignite, and we've got to have oxygen. That's about as simple as you could possibly make it. And we refer to this as the fire triangle. So throughout this or any other presentation, if somebody's talking about a fire triangle, then they're talking about those three uh, components happening. Now, there can be many different layers of that fire triangle, other things you can add in there. Uh, this is about as simple as I've stated as you're going to see. So let's look at a couple of the classifications of fires. Uh, first of all, we got a Class A fire. Class A are your routine run-of-the-mill uh, combustibles like paper, wood, clothing, uh, things of that nature. Things generally that you'd be able to put out with water. A Class A fire extinguisher is used on these ordinary combustibles and usually the Class A fire extinguishers are water-based. If you have a pump tank extinguisher, you got to make sure that you're checking that periodically. Uh, generally speaking, uh, periodically could be twice a year, could be once a year, but we need to make sure that not only do we have enough uh, water present, uh, but we need to make sure that it's functioning properly as well. And really you should call in a, a professional um, to do your inspection of the fire extinguishers at least once a year. And a side note, when we're talking about water-based units, anytime we're talking about water for that matter, there's a chance of freezing if you get too cold. So keep that in mind. Use common sense uh, when you're uh, placing a Class A fire extinguisher in a building. Don't put it in an area where it could possibly be subject to freezing. Class B fires are fires that involve flammable liquids. Could be flammable oils uh, or greases, gasoline, paint, things like that. Things that you would not put out with water, right? We've all heard the adage, if you put water on a grease fire, well, not only do you not put out the grease fire, you've made the fire uh, loads uh, bigger. So we want to make sure uh, that we're using a proper fire extinguisher on a Class B fire. And uh, when it comes to the fire extinguisher, there are a few that you can choose from. Probably the most common is going to be your, your CO2 fire extinguisher. Uh, but there are also dry chemicals and foam that can be used as well. And it's worth noting that all three of these types that could be used to put out a Class B fire could also be used to put out a Class A fire. Not always true going forward, say into Class C, but uh, we'll talk about that uh, when the time gets here. So what's the difference between a Class B fire extinguisher and a Class A fire extinguisher? Tick tock, tick tock, time's up. The CO2 style fire extinguisher is going to steal the air, right? It's going to displace that oxygen from the scenario so there's not enough oxygen to support that flame. And what happens? Stifles the flame, starves it of oxygen, it goes out. Uh, the Class A fire extinguisher, the water-based style, it steals the heat. Okay, so we, we're, we're achieving the same goal. We're putting the fire out, but there's two different ways of doing it. When it comes to the Class B fire extinguishers and you are using the dry chemical style, those work uh, about the same way as many of the other fire extinguishers out there as far as functionality, but they're simply taking away that chemical reaction uh, of the combustion. We've got a couple of different styles, right? One type contains sodium bicarbonate, potassium bicarbonate, potassium uh, chloride-based agents. Uh, also, When it comes to foam fire extinguishers, they are a little bit different. Why are they a little bit different? Well, they caused me to backtrack just a little bit. Just a second ago, I said you cannot use water-style fire extinguishers to put out a Class B fire. 
meaning the pump style like you would use on classification of A fires. However, the AFFF fire extinguishers, which stands for aqueous film forming foam uh, fire extinguishers, which create a foam, they are water based. And that water based foam spreads, covers the fire area, and stifles the oxygen. So again, we're stealing the oxygen. It's just a little bit different way to do it. But because they are water based, this makes it so that they cannot be used for class C fires. And speaking of class C fires, let's talk about those. Uh, class C fires are a lively bunch, literally. When it comes to class C fires, they're, they're uh, uh, electrical fires. And anytime that you've got an electrical fire, it's always assumed that the fire is uh, on live electrical equipment, thus the uh, dry joke about being a live bunch, right? Um, so, Class C electrical fires can happen in any number of ways. There are several different instances that come to mind for you right now. For instance, let's say we got too many things plugged into a circuit. Too many things plugged into a circuit can overload the circuit. An overloaded circuit draws more amperage, creates more heat, can melt the sheathing on the wire, and most of the sheathing for the wires are flammable, so they themselves uh, can begin to burn. But think about it on the refrigeration side of things. Oftentimes in a refrigeration room or in a refrigeration skid or inside of a uh, compartment or casing of a refrigeration appliance, there's a little bit of oil. Let's say we overamp, we've got a small spark, a small spark on that oil, especially if it's misty oil, it can ignite it, burn the sheathing off the wire. Now we've got live wires that are uncovered and we've got a fire. So there are those situations that you get fires that are electrically related that you could very easily be live. And because of that, because that's the most present danger, it's always assumed that an electrical fire is on live equipment. What does that mean? Well, that means if you're putting out a fire on electrical equipment, you better make sure whatever you're using doesn't bridge the gap between the panel and yourself. What's worse than an electrical fire? An electrical, and fi electrical fire that's a live electrical fire in which somehow something between you and it is electrically conductive and bridges that gap. Now you're part of that electrical pathway. So always use something that's electrically non-conductive uh, for your uh, fire control. So let's look at a couple of those. Uh, first of all, a few of the ones from the class B selection that we talked about are okay to use also in class C. Uh, CO2 extinguishers and dry chemical extinguishers uh, are very effective when fighting an electrical fire. However, as I previously pointed out, you cannot, should not, do not use foam extinguishers on an electrical fire. Those are water-based. Water-based means that it's going to be electrically conductive and it will create an intensely uh, dangerous situation for you or anybody that's using it. Class A and B extinguishers may be used if electrical equipment is not energized. However, best policy, best practices as a company, as an individual, or as a owner of an establishment having somebody out doing work, always assume it's live that way, you're always taking the best safety precautions available to you at the time. Class D. Class D is combustible metals. Now, how would metal just combust? Well, we're not talking quarter-inch thick steel under most circumstances. We are talking uh, industrial plants, manufacturing facilities in which 
metal has now become powdered or created a dust in the air and the dust is so much dust that there's enough there to ignite and there's enough oxygen present to support that flame. Now one of the things that's a little bit different about class D fires than other, other style of fires, they're hotter and they take special uh, control measures to get them under control. Generally speaking, Class D fire extinguishers are going to be dry powder extinguishers. And when it comes to the dry powder extinguishers used specifically for Class D fires, oftentimes uh, local fire stations do not have the means to put out uh, a Class D fire along with them on their fire trucks. So they're going to rely on whatever's at the facility to put that out. So make uh, real sure that you've got the proper uh, control measures there at the facility. If you're not going to be the one that's going to use them, make sure they're there for the fire department uh, when they get there. Very dangerous to try to control these yourself. Additionally, on fire extinguishers, when you've got a fire extinguisher and you've got the ABC rating on there or D okay? or maybe you have all of them maybe you've gone down to your local home store and you've got a universal one which consequently oftentimes are less expensive because they're more common you know as well as I do the less common something is like a B only or an A only the more expensive it will be eh, I always relate that back to a 24-hour gas station having locks on the doors I once asked why do you have locks on a 24-hour open gas station? And the manager simply replied, because it was more expensive to get the doors without the locks, because it's uncommon. Hmm, smart. In addition to the ABC rating, in addition to the color coding, in addition to the picture of the triangle, the square, the circle, the star, we also have numbers. What do the numbers mean? Well, depending on which side of the table you sit on, it could indicate the size of the fire that you can use that fire extinguisher on, or it could indicate how long that you're going to be able to depress the handle. Uh, either way, guess what? You're right. Uh, give you an example. An extinguisher classified as 4A can be expected to extinguish a Class A fire twice as large as that of a unit classified as a 2A. So you're going to have a number designation and a picture and a letter most often on fire extinguishers. And this is there for our safety so that everybody around us, uh, no matter the person, is able to decipher what they've got there for their fire control. Uh, make sure that periodic inspection uh, is taking place with these fire extinguishers as well. In most municipalities, that's mandatory at least once a year, where you've got the fire marshal um, or your fire inspector coming through, uh, tapping on your extinguishers, making sure they're um, up to scuff on their charge, uh, that they're not in any kind of disrepair or, or damaged uh, at all in any way. Uh, and it's a very simple, very quick process. And oftentimes, like I said, your local fire department, fire inspector, uh, or your fire marshal would usually be happy to come through and make sure that you're up in good shape. Proper fire extinguisher use. You should only attempt to use a fire extinguisher if each of these things are checked off. Now granted, everything happens in a split second. So just use common sense and most of these things will be taken care of. But for the purpose of this presentation, we're going to go through them one by one. Make sure the building is being evacuated. Don't grab a fire extinguisher and not let anybody know there's an issue. If there's an issue that requires you to get a fire extinguisher, somebody else needs to know. There may be follow-up required. You could put out the fire now and in a short while it could rekindle itself as it's smolder smoldering uh, underneath the surface. Make sure the fire department's been called. Professionals should be called. They should be on the way, even though you may not need them, 
uh, even though it might be small, they've got to come out and look at it. It's the right thing to do. Properties at stake, human lives could be at stake. You should only apply them uh, or, or use the fire extinguisher in applications where the fire is small or even contained. And the exit's clear. Oftentimes, when a person's using a fire extinguisher, they're using a fire extinguisher for their means of exit. Is this right, wrong, and different? Well, think about it. If you're sitting in a class full of people and the fire alarm goes off and there's a stairway or a hallway before your exit, one of the smart things to do is, obviously, eyes and ears, make sure that you're looking around, see if you can see the fire. Uh, if there's a door you've got to go through, get close to the door, see if you can feel any heat on that. If there's no heat, have a fire extinguisher with the lead guy going out, open that door, allow the lead guy to go with the fire extinguisher so that he can be prepared to cool off any pathways uh, for everybody to get out safely. The lead guy is going to get your way uh, through that hallway, through that doorway, to the outside with that fire extinguisher as a means of escape. Uh, so as a safety uh, device, if you, if you would. Stay low, avoid any smoke. We've often heard it's not necessarily the flames that do the damage. Uh, it's the smoke that's in the air that's inhaled, and even though you get out, it could do long-term damage. So it may not be far to go, but if there's smoke present, don't chance it. Get down low below that smoke and crawl your way out. Make sure that there's a proper fire extinguisher available. Some areas may have a fire extinguisher, they might have a fire blanket available. Make sure whatever you're using is proper for the job. You would certainly not want to put fire uh, out in an electrical panel with a class A fire extinguisher. You just wouldn't want to do it. Or something that had the aqueous foam in there. Uh, you don't want to have a casualty with the person trying to put out the fire because he bridged the gap in the electrical system. Use the buddy system. The buddy system is great in any dangerous situation. Whether you're watching a scary movie uh, and there's two police officers on the hunt for the bad guy, there's usually two of them. Uh, when you're fighting a fire uh, or trying to get out of the building or you're trying to contain a fire until the fire department gets there, use the buddy system. You're going to be concentrating on that fire. If you're not, your chances of doing any good with the fire extinguisher uh, are extremely diminished. Have somebody else there keeping out a look or keeping a lookout for you so that if that fire creeps up, they're going to see it. They're going to warn you, and you can feel comfortable that they'll attack. That way, your concentration will be on the fire. When it comes to the proper fire extinguisher use, once you've decided to use it, use it. Don't mess around. Always remember, uh, pass with the fire extinguisher, and it's going to help you um, use it. What does PASS stand for? Pull the pin, aim the extinguisher, squeeze the trigger handle, and sweep it side to side. Now, where are you going to aim that extinguisher at? Well, when you think about it, go to the source. If you're cutting down a tree, you don't start high up in the limbs. Well, maybe for the stragglers you do. That way you're not taking down other stuff. Maybe not the best example, but you get my point. You want to start down low. You want to take that whole thing down. And then you're going to cut it up once you get down on the ground. Same thing with a fire. You're not going to start up in the flickering part of the flame that's way up at the top. You're going to start down at the base, and you're going to try to stifle that flame clear down at the base. Sweep it side to side, uh, and it'll be much more effective uh, than just aimlessly shooting it at a fire. Make sure uh, that you're decisive in what you're doing. You only get about a minute uh, in using a fire extinguisher that you can depress that handle before you run out of gusto in that fire extinguisher. So obviously the bigger the number on the fire extinguisher the longer you're going to be able to depress that handle. Uh, however, in any case it's got to be quick. Make sure um, 
that you've got proper instruction uh, for your particular location from your fire department. Oftentimes, they're glad to come out once a year to train your guys, or even more often than that. When it comes to uh, finding out what the actual standards are, uh, NFPA 10 is where you're going to find them for the fire extinguishers. What are you going to find in there? Well, pretty much all of the minimum requirements for all types and sizes of extinguishers, as well as locations. And what you're looking at there is, you know, what's the type of hazard? You know, what what type of flammability or combustibility do we have in this location? Is there only one? Could there be more than one? Is it possible that we need to get a universal extinguisher that has the ABC rating on it? Do we need to have that D fire extinguisher, even though it's only uh, for one location? What degree is the hazard? You know, is there a high likelihood that we're going to have an issue? Are you brazing in there? Are there sparks and arcs and uh, and oil and, and, and things like that, fumes present? What kind of danger are we actually talking about? And how, uh, you know, how dangerous is it? How, is it there all the time because of normal business, normal practices? Or is it usually contained and it only happens uh, in that one-off situation where there's a crack or a leak or... Or, or drainage or something like that. How big of an area do we need to protect? Well, how big of an area do we need to protect goes a long ways because it doesn't tell you that you're going to have a huge fire tank, a fire truck tank size fire extinguisher if you've got a big, large open building uh, or a convention center or a hall or something like that. What it's telling you is how many fire extinguishers do I need? What's the spacing going to be? Uh, so those three right there go a long ways. Uh, what type of hazard do we have? How serious is the hazard? Is it there all the time or is it there just by accident or sometimes? What type of area size-wise are we talking about protecting? Uh, and we've got to have these things in the normal path of travel. You can't have them put in a closet where nobody's going to see it or behind items or under things. They've got to be out in the plain, uh, wide open space. Now. Two ways to look at that. Some people will look and say, oh my goodness, it just looks so ugly and tacky. I've heard that. Well, other people will look at it as, wow, they really take safety seriously. Uh, I feel good to be in this establishment because of that. Don't obstruct these things from view. If they're out of view, it's just as good as not having them at all. When it comes to placement of these, they shouldn't be mounted higher from the floor to the top of the extinguisher than five foot if they're 40 pounds or less, or three and a half foot if they're heavier than 40 pounds. So there are actually height requirements as well. In addition to your placement as far as how high off the floor, you're also going to have a distance requirement in placing your fire extinguisher. And we're not talking about, you know, just caddy corner and everything. We're talking, as the way it's worded, the maximum travel distance between fire extinguishers does not exceed blank. Okay, so travel distance what we're talking about. And of course, it's got to be out in the open, as we talked about. 75 feet for a Class A style fire extinguisher, so you'd be in a Class A style uh, fire hazard. Or 50 foot for a Class C style fire uh, hazard in, in fire area. So now we're talking electrical fires. They should be checked regularly. Make sure that they're in their designated locations, uh, especially if things have changed. Make sure they haven't been tampered with or used. You know, some... Uh, the silly guy comes along and just messes around with it, and, and now it's not uh, not going to be there for you in, in proper working order when you actually have a fire. And make sure that they don't have any kind of corrosion or damage or, or any other impairments uh, to the outside casing or, or to their functional uh, properties. I, when it comes to inspections uh, and maintenance, they should be examined at least once a year by 
a bona fide fire extinguisher company, um, or it could be by your fire marshal or your uh, fire inspector. This type of pro uh, preventative maintenance program uh, is about the best thing that you can come across uh, as far as keeping your equipment reliable and in and, and its good working order as it's supposed to be. I mean, when you look at the whole idea behind this stuff, it's to make sure it's there when you need it. And that's your formal style of, of, of checks that you should do on your fire extinguishers. Now, informally, make sure every time you're on a work site, you know where the fire extinguisher is. If there isn't one out there, oftentimes people aren't going to go tell the, the general, hey, I need to have a fire extinguisher over here, uh, you know, because they don't want to seem out of place or uh, too abrupt. Get your own. Bring one from your van. Bring one from the shop. If you need to have one buy in, one's not available. The idea is to make sure that your work area is safe. Check the inspection date on the existing ones that are there on the work site, and then also glance at that stuff at your own shop, in your van, at your house. The best pr protection by far is going to be making sure that your area is secure and protected and and all potential combustibles and flammables have been protected or isolated uh, from a situation that's going to cause them to flame up before you're starting your service or work in a building make sure um, that the alarm system in any building whether it's a constructive building uh, for commercial or industrial or a home make sure that there's a fire suppression system is working now we've talked an awful lot about flammable and combustible liquids and gases and things like that so it's worth taking just a second here uh, to isolate those couple of items and describe the difference between them first of all uh, if we're talking flammable that means it can ignite below 100 degrees something like gasoline or paint thinner if we're talking about combustibles combustibles have to get above 100 degrees uh, in order to ignite there we're probably going to be talking about fuel oil uh, or kerosene or something like that just as examples there might be other serious uh, threats or health uh, risks that are associated with those uh, aside from the flammability and combustibility uh, if you go to inhaling these or getting them on your skin what's going to happen uh, you should really check the MSDS sheet how, I, how, how do you get exposed to this certain product or, or chemical uh, do you breathe it in uh, do, you, do you have to ingest it uh, it does just have to touch your skin and then once you've been exposed to it uh, how do you know does it cause an, a rash? Are you gonna Are you gonna have a, a cough, a, a nuisance cough? Are you gonna have a a, a twitch or or something uh, involuntary happen? And then once you figure that out, how do you get rid of the problem? How, how do you mitigate the issue? Uh, can you just wash it off? Does it require medical treatment? Does it require medicine for extended periods of time? And then after you've mitigated the issue. Uh, for the immediate time, are there any long-term side effects? All of those questions can be answered on the MSDS sheet. The fire hazards most frequently associated with refrigeration and air conditioning work uh, usually are going to be classified in any of the three areas. Could be Class A, Class B, or Class C. Uh, class D may be a little bit of a one-off. Uh, but the other three uh, generally could be associated with our refrigeration systems or HVACR systems. When you think about it, we're dealing with refrigerants and under the right circumstances, if you're vaporizing a refrigerant uh, or putting it under pressure, refrigerants certainly uh, can be flammable. Uh, and we're also dealing with solvents. You think about flushing agents that go through the system to flush out the line sets and such. Uh, fuels we're dealing with. Um, furnaces, 
Uh, and then, of course, construction materials all around. Uh, and then just the products that are being refrigerated themselves. Uh, maybe we're doing comfort cooling and we've got a, a cube farm where there's all kinds of flammable items. Or maybe we're just cooling stuff and we've got a warehouse full of cardboard boxes and, and, and things of that nature. Let's look at a few of these. If we're looking at oils, oils normally don't present a fire hazard. However, if the oil is spilling or leaking out or in some way, shape, or form uh, is being misted, uh, for instance, if you've got a puncture in an oil filter and because you've got that puncture, you've got high pressure and the oil is uh, spitting out of the side of that filter, uh, into the air, it's going to have enough present to ignite, most likely. So make sure that there's no oil present during your work, and uh, certainly make sure that if there is, be very careful and deactivate any lighting source or any ignition source and clean up the problem. Next comes solvents. Most solvents can be handled relatively safely at normal room temperatures, but once you elevate that temperature up around or above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, that's where things start to go sideways. Make sure you keep the room well ventilated, don't be smoking, and make sure that you keep a handle on the materials that you're using. When it comes to fuels, there's a lot of them out there that we use on a regular basis, whether it be in our vehicles uh, or be in our tools to do our normal work. Uh, yet we also, under the same token, don't necessarily take the best practices approach to using these items all the time. Now we're talking about natural gas, LP, uh, fuel oil uh, as well, and then oftentimes kerosene, depending on your area of the country, uh, could be used as well. All of these are highly flammable, and if you confine them, it increases the pressure. What happens when you increase pressure? You increase temperature. You will reach their flash point under a relatively small amount of pressure. You reach the flash point, and a boom happens. Make sure you're handling these with care, and I would certainly hope that I don't have to say this, but again, don't be smoking or using arcs and sparks around fuel. Now, general housekeeping, uh, we've had good housekeeping principles for a long period of time, but it's worth talking about. It's worth talking about even at your safety meeting, uh, not just for the flammability and combustibility reasons, but also people could slip and trip if you're not keeping debris and, and uh, hazards out of the way in your normal high traffic areas, right? Uh, so we're not just talking about uh, flames here or combustibility. We're talking about also just practicality. Make sure that all combustibles and flammable uh, uh, items are stored properly. If you've got combustible waste materials, make sure they're stored in a covered metal receptacle. Any refrigeration and air conditioning systems got to be kept clean. If you've got oil covering and coating the inside of those cabinets and wires, you're creating a ripe situation where these things could flame up. Uh, when it comes to cleaning our, our, our office spaces or our warehouses or work sites, uh, sweeping compounds that we use are oftentimes combustible. So when you're putting down sweeping compound, make sure you get all back up off the floor. And again, make sure that you're not smoking while you're doing it. Uh, it creates a hazard for everybody involved, especially when we're talking sweeping compounds because it's scattered over a large area, usually of a large building. Uh, when it comes to floor covering, uh, cover, coverings and cleaning solutions, um, if they say they've got a low flash point uh, material, they can still be dangerous. Uh, you, the low flash point materials, um, like oily mops and rags, should be stored in metal containers still. Make sure 
that fire extinguishers are around, they're properly maintained, and they're regularly inspected. And after they're used, get them refilled as soon as possible. Precautions we really need to go over very quickly just to sum some of this stuff up uh, before we get to the closing here are really, really common fire causes. We've got electrical malfunctions. Electrical malfunctions don't necessarily have to be caused by you. If you're out there working on a, on a condenser uh, or any kind of refrigeration skid or ventilation system, Electrical malfunctions can occur because of overloading, uh, aged products, sparks and arcs, uh, improperly used uh, parts. We've got friction. Anytime you're in a manufacturing plant or commercial building, you could have belts running. Uh, belts or, or textiles or fabrics, they can cause friction, which causes heat. And heat leads to flammability and combustion. Open flames, always an issue. Uh, not, uh, not to be undersold here, open flames are lighters, cigarettes, candles. Candles are highly common in workplaces uh, nowadays. Sparks. Sparks could be caused from any number of items, whether it's a simple light switch or somebody unplugging an appliance. Possibly it's appliances turning on and off. Uh, routinely because of remote controls. Uh, sparks happen, they're always a common source of ignition. Plain old hot surfaces. One of the things we didn't have to think of when we're looking at hot surface is the old uh, the old style hot plates now have been turned into new style, lower heat mind you, candle heaters. Cigarette smoking uh, obviously can be a, a, a very large source of, of ignition for fires. Reduce the risks by making sure that every technician has a fire extinguisher in the vehicle. In fact, I'd go out on a limb here and say if you get pulled over by commercial vehicle enforcement or, or DOT, they're going to probably want to see that you have a fire extinguisher on board and the type of fire extinguisher is going to be determined by what you're carrying in that vehicle. Every shop's got to have at least one fire extinguisher always available. Remember the placement and the height based on NFPA 10 principles. Direct that stream to the base of the flame and not on the flame itself. Never throw water on an oil-based fire. Should go without saying. Now ask yourself, why would I not want to throw water on an oil-based fire? Fairly simple oil and water don't mix. It's going to spread that fire. Don't leave oily rags or mops around. If you throw out a cigarette or a match, don't let them go out all by themselves. Take that little exerted effort to put them out. Change your work clothes as soon as you get home if possible, especially if they're oily. Don't smoke in bed. Keep your uh, truck and for that matter, your work area and your shop, free from junk. Don't let stuff pile up. Keep things in an orderly manner. Make sure you know where your fire extinguisher is. It'll be easier to get to it. And it'll be easier to spot your fire hazards as well. Make sure that anytime you're handling any kind of gases, that you're handling it with care. You don't want to spill this stuff over or leave it all confined. Make sure that you're just well aware of all of the possible situations anytime that you're on the job or at home for that matter. Only takes a fraction of a second to ignite a flammable gas. Don't discharge any flammable gas in any unventilated room or space. It doesn't make sense to do so. It'll accumulate. Some of the things that often uh, happen on the job site, especially on the install side of things. We're down there gluing uh, our condensate drains or potentially venting out a furnace or a water heater. And we've used glue for a long period of time and maybe even left the cap off for a while. That glue accumulates and you now have a highly flammable 
uh, situation there in the basement. So you want to make sure that some time passes where you can get some ventilation down there to clear those items. Out. To sum this stuff up, we've got some uh, tips that we're going to go over here at the very end, and they're very simple. They're common sense, but again, they're worth bringing up. That's what safety meetings are for, to bring things that we do every day so routinely over and over and over to the forefront of our mind so that we're thinking about it again. Remove trash and, and uh, items from your work area at least once a day. Get rid of any oily, greasy, or painted rags uh, or towels and make sure and put them into metal covered containers. Keep any kind of solvents or flammable combustible materials in labeled containers so that other people other than yourself know that there are some things in those containers uh, that could potentially ignite. Keep any kind of sparks or, or arcs uh, or excessive heat away from any of the solvents or, or ignitable materials and don't use any of these flammable liquids or gases for anything other than what they're intended to be used for. You're just asking for trouble uh, in that sense. Keep in all the fire exits and passageways clear. Make sure that firefighting equipment uh, or things you're going to use to control that flame are always in good repair and always ready to be used. After all, we never know when something's going to happen. Practice fire drills to make sure that everybody's prepared. It seems like uh, a childish thing to do or a monotonous thing to do, but it saves lives. Uh, for any more information, you can go to the State Department of Labor and Industry, or you can refer uh, over to the National Fire Protection Association. You can go to nfpa.org. Uh, the fire protection, the NFPA section that you would be referring to for fire extinguishers would be NFPA 10. For more information pertaining to any of the subjects that we've just covered, or for bulk quantities of educational materials for either the general public or your internal employees, please contact your local fire department or chapter of the NFPA.